Well, uh, thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Pastor Parker. I'm the, the pastor here at Calvary. If you're new, if you're a guest with us today, I just want to uh, invite you and just say we're so glad to have you. Uh, we'd love to connect with you. I'll be around after service. And so uh, please come and connect with me. We'd love to talk with you about what Calvary's all about and how you can be engaged in what we do here. Um, Next week, we'll be starting a, uh, a new series, a several month long series of study in Philippians. And so if you'd like to go ahead and read ahead, like some of you I think like to do, go ahead and you can test me next Sunday, see if what I say is totally bogus or not. Um, but today we're gonna be in Romans 12, uh, verses one through two. So go ahead and turn over there to Romans 12. Uh, we were in Romans last week as well. This epistle, I'll just give a little context. This epistle authored by Paul is written to the church in Rome in maybe the mid-50s A.D. And so Paul, not having yet visited Rome, he writes this letter uh, to kind of prepare the way for his eventual visit there. And so in the letter, he presents a clear and basic system of salvation to a church who's not yet heard from him. Maybe they've heard from people he's taught, from other evangelists, but they have not yet heard from Paul. And so Paul writes here kind of a basic system of salvation to this church. And a major theme in this letter, this letter to the Romans, is God's overall plan of redemption and how the Jew and the Gentile each fit into it. And so, while this was written to the church in Rome at this very specific time, we must remember that this was intended, Paul wrote this, intended to be taught and shared with Christians everywhere throughout the region and beyond, amongst all believers. And so, what Paul writes here, and what we're going to read today, is supremely relevant to our lives now. Uh, it applies to all people who have come to a saving faith in Christ. And so... At this point, where we're coming in here at Romans 12, just to paint a picture, Paul has concluded kind of more of the doctrinal part of his letter, the more systematic theology part of his letter, and he starts moving into personal application. How do you live in light of all that we've talked about for these previous 11 chapters that Paul has previously written here? And so now we're seeing practical applications built on the foundation of what was written. And so, we're only looking at two verses today, verses one through two, okay? But these two verses are so massive, massively significant to the Christian life. Does anyone know Tim Keller? Anyone ever heard of Tim Keller? Pastor, theologian, Tim Keller. What Tim Keller says about these two verses is that they can be thought of as a summary of the whole Christian life. And so think about that as we go ahead and we read these two verses. Would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Beginning in verse 1, chapter 12 of Romans. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. This is the holy, perfect, and inerrant word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess your goodness, and we confess your sovereignty today. As we look at this text, as we study it, I pray that you would illuminate your word for us, that we might rightly understand it, empower us to understand it, but break us down, humble us, that we might submit to you in your word. I pray be with us today, and and uh, let your spirit fill us as we hear from your word and as we study it together. Uh, I pray you would bless me, and as I preach this, um, let my words and thoughts be your words and thoughts. We pray this together in the name of the Son and by the Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. And so, to begin this, this chunk, I, I think it's incredibly interesting the the way that Paul lays out his argument. He basically has three imperatives of, or three things he calls people to do out of this passage. I'll tell you, tell you them right now. Submit yourselves as a living sacrifice. Do not be conformed to this world. Instead, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Those three things. But the basis by which he calls us to do things is so good what does he say in verse 1? He starts by saying, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. 
Because of the mercies of God and the redemption of man, Paul charges these people to devote themselves to God as a living sacrifice, being conformed to his will, being transformed by the renewing of their mind. Um, these mercies Paul speaks about and bases his appeal on are the ones he's already, and we haven't read all the 11 chapters before, but these are the ones he's already been talking about through these previous uh, chapters in Romans. He is pointing back to the whole argument he has been building since verse 118. Okay, there is some serious contextual momentum leading up until this point in the book of Romans. And so whenever you were a kid, right, whenever you were being a little rebellious or uh, maybe you were fighting with your mom or with your dad, just, just, you know, go back in time a little bit. For some of us, that's longer than others. But go back in time a little bit. Okay, think about a chore or some other responsibility. Whenever your parent asks you to do something and you say, no, I don't want to do it, have you ever had them pull out the parent card? Okay, Riley's smiling at me. She knows what I'm talking about. What, what's the parent card? That's whenever you say, Mom, I don't want to do that, or whatever, I don't want to do that. And your mom says, hey, listen, I birthed you. Don't you know that I put a roof over your head? I put food in your stomach. Do you know how long I was in labor? It doesn't matter how bad, how bad uh, you don't want to do that thing. That's kind of the total, like, absolute trump card, right? And basically, and, and you know, maybe we're guilty of doing that too. You know, if any of our, us are parents in the room, maybe we've pulled the parent card. But it's a pretty good card to pull, right? Like it's a pretty persuasive argument. Look at how much I have done for you, how much I have sacrificed for you. You're not willing to pick up a few socks off the floor? Like, come on, okay? It's a solid argument. Maybe it's a little manipulative, I don't know. But in this, in this case, it is a right argument that Paul makes. Look at the mercies of God. Paul in Romans 12, he's making the same point. What mercies? Well, let's go back a little bit. In Romans, uh, Paul, Paul talks about how God gives us righteousness by his grace. God gives us righteousness by his grace. Uh, chapter 3, verses 22. Chapter 4, uh, verse 6. He gives us eternal life. We see that in 521, 623, 811. He frees us from condemnation. We see that in 81. His spirit intercedes for us, 826 through 27. And he provides his love from which we can never, ever be separated. We see in 835 through 39. And so Paul, in the book of Romans, he's just stressed how the justification, the sanctification, and the salvation of men are all works of God, not of ourselves, but of God. Okay? And so human efforts aren't what has brought us into the new life. Only God has. Amen? This being the case, Paul writes, a person who is the recipient of this incredible grace, by view of the mercies of God, you need to take on a new perspective of gratitude and motive and deep devotion for God, which says, whatever you call me to do, Lord, I am all yours. Just think about the hymn we just say, sang. Have, you, have, have your way with me, O oh God. I am yours. This is Paul giving instruction for how we should rightly respond to it. Okay, and what are the three things he says? Well, we see the first imperative here. He says, present your bodies. In view of the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. In the Old Testament, and animal sacrifices were offered for, to atone for sin. Uh, but with the coming of Christ, his sacrifice on the cross has fulfilled the requirement once and for all. Okay, and so now we see something a little bit different. Instead of animal sacrifice, we, now we are called to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, which means surrendering our whole, our whole selves, our whole being to God and his purposes. The use of the word living here does imply that the sacrifice is meant to be perpetual. It is not a one-time event. It is a perpetual sacrificial living, a life that is uh, of worship that is being presented to God. Now, this is an extension this is an extension of how people thought about sacrifices. 
Now, more than just an animal being consumed at an altar, there's a responsibility and a continual dedication. This isn't, you know, God letting us off the hook. This is actually calling for something even greater. This isn't something to be neglected and forgotten. This is a distinction between Christians and animal sacrifices because Christians will not be put to death as the animals were, but are instead to die daily to self, to follow Christ. Instead, the charge Paul gives is to make a lifelong commitment to sacrifice. Similar to the sentiment that Jesus gives us in, in Luke 9, uh, 23, Jesus says this, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And so, Paul is saying the same thing. He's, he's, he's returning to this call that Christ each gives us. And let's talk about the quality of this sacrifice for a moment, too. This, this living sacrifice that we're supposed to offer basically ourselves to God. It's being described as necessarily holy and acceptable to God. What does that mean? Well, in Deuteronomy 15, 21, we hear about what sacrifices are supposed to be in the Old Testament. It says, but if there's any defect in the animal, if it's lame or blind or has any serious defect, you must not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. And so continuing this reference, right, just as a lamb was to be without blemish, to be the best, not, not lame or blind or have any serious effect, how it's supposed to be holy and acceptable before God in order to sacrifice it, so we too are supposed to sacrifice ourselves being holy and acceptable to God. The quality of our sacrifice is significant. We're supposed to be without blemish in the same way as we sacrificially live for God. It's clear that what's supposed to be valued most dear to a person could not be withheld from God. And so that which you cling to most dearly, you cannot keep that from God. It's supposed to be a, a to total, to total surrender of all of self. It's to live a life with, which is perpetually holy, to sacrifice one's whole life, to be pleasing to God. And so it's important here to know, Paul is not talking about what is required in order to enter into a saving relationship with God. He's writing to a group that he already considers his brothers, right? And so what Paul is writing here is instruction for how a person can and should, in his present personal relationship with God, live according to this relationship with God. Paul is explaining what will happen if a person becomes a living sacrifice. He's also explaining what it takes to be a living sacrifice. It's both a necessary component to and an end result, end result of being a living sacrifice that a person is holy and pleasing to God. This means that every, everyone say every, every, Every part of our lives should be devoted to God's glory. That means our minds, our bodies, our emotions, our talents, and our time should all be offered up to God as a living sacrifice. And this is not just a one-time event. This is a continual process of submitting ourselves to God's will and allowing him to use us for his purposes. We can't do the hokey pokey as a living sacrifice where he put... You know, our right arm in, our right ar arm out, our right arm in. Shake it all about. You know, we, we, we have to do with the end of the hokey pokey. Sometimes we only want to put a part of ourselves in and then, you know, maybe not even that. We have to do the end of the pokey, hokey pokey. We have to put our whole selves in. How's that for an elementary illustration, right? We have to put our, our whole selves in to this living sacrifice that God has called us to be. And so the question we kind of have to ask ourselves is, is God the God of some things or is he the God of all things? Think about that question. Because if he's the God of some things, okay, we offer some of ourselves to him. But if he is the God over all things, if he is totally good and totally sovereign over all of creation, then should we not offer all of ourselves unto him? And so ask yourself, how much would you say that you put your whole self in whenever it comes to, to your dedication to God? 
put a percentage point on it. 70%, 50%, 25 No, the scripture calls us. God commands us to submit all. Not, nothing short of 100% of ourselves is acceptable to God. And so what must be surrendered today that you're holding back? What are you giving half-heartedly to God See, worship here is described as a lifestyle. And so it says this is your truth. This is your spiritual worship. And this is happening logically out of what is previously happening. Remember the intro, the, the, the plea, the argument that Paul gives out of the mercies of God. This, okay? And so this is coming out of an understanding of the mercies of God. What is worship? Well, we often consider it to be, you know, specific acts of praise, adoration. These are things we call worship. But here, this is talking about something even bigger. Offering yourself each day as a living sacrifice is your true and spiritual worship. This is what it means to live the Christian life. And how do you live this out? Well, this is why we're looking at Philippians coming up next week and for the, for the next few months is because Philippians teaches us what it means to live as this living sacrifice, okay? And it teaches us who we're supposed to be as a church. And so I think it's very appropriate, and I'm really excited to be in Philippians. But in Philippians, what we'll see, in, starting next week, is that Paul lives this out because whenever he writes the book of Philippians, he's in prison. Whenever he's sent to the prison for the gospel, where his body becomes oppressed, but his soul remains free, he is living out this truth. He has sacrificed much for the gospel, including his own earthly freedom. But he does this because he is confident and secure in his eternal freedom. And due to the mercies of God, in view of them, he wears his chains with peace and contentment, as we're going to see. And he is knowing that his sacrifice is pleasing before the Lord. The second imperative that the scripture gives us, that Paul gives us, is to not be conformed to the ways of this world. This further qualifies what it means to live as this living sacrifice, to, to live with one's whole life, one's whole body devoted to God. Those in Christ must resist the evil pressures of this world. And so what are some of the temptations? I mean, think just very, very inwardly for a moment. What are some of the temptations, the corruptions of this world which are most attractive to you? It's probably jumping at you immediately. What are the things which draw you out of the world, into the world? Think about that. If you are in Christ, you are called to put all of these things in you to death. That's what Colossians 3 teaches. And instead, and this is the, the third and final imperative in this text, instead of being conformed to the, 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 the way of the world, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Be transformed by the image of Christ. People are called to be holy. And so what does it mean to be holy, as it talks about in this text? Well, the word, means, the word holy means set apart. And so just as you have been set apart by God, for God, so too should our actions and our thoughts be set apart from the world. They should be set apart. They should be different. They should look more like Christ than look like ourselves and the world. You must be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think about that phrase, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Well, what does that look like? I like how Paul writes about this in Colossians 3. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And so our thoughts and attitudes shape our character. They shape our actions. You don't have to be a Christian to see that. Uh, there's all kinds of different philosophers from all over the world who have come to the, the, the realization of this reality, this truth. And so there's a, a famous Chinese Taoist philosopher, I'm going to butcher his name, Lao Tzu, who famously said this, you may have heard this and maybe seen it pop up on like a Facebook post or something. Um, I like this quote. He says, watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. 
Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. And so you see what just starts as a thought. If you do not control it, can become your destiny. God calls us to renew our minds. Renew our minds, point it to heavenly things, not earthly things. Because where we look, where we cast our attention, what we think about, that shapes who we are and what we do and who we become, who we serve. It's kind of like learning how to drive, you know. Who I, I didn't, didn't uh, I think I saw Catherine Morrison just finally started to drive. I saw that pop up on Facebook. I said I moved to, moved to Newcastle at the wrong time. <laughs> Whenever you're learning how to drive, or, or I, I taught my, my brothers recently before I left for here how to ride a bike. Whenever you're learning how to drive or ride a bike, one of the things you have to know is where you look is where you're naturally, your body's just going to go. And so you want to look where you want to go, not where you don't want to go, or whatever distracts you on the side is going to in, eventually uh, you know, be your destiny. That's where, if you look at a pretty tree, you're going to careen into the tree, okay? And so look where you want to go in your relationship with Christ, in your walk with Christ. Look where you want to go or else you'll find yourself colliding with whatever attracts your eye. If you do not guard your thoughts, you are quickly going to find yourself doing that which is unholy and dishonoring to God. Therefore, we need to renew our minds with something different. We take something out, we need to put something in. If we don't, if we're, uh, it's really easy to take something negative out, but if we don't have a plan for what we're putting in there, whatever is available is just going to fill the hole. And so what are we supposed to fill the hole, the hole with? Well, it's God's Word. As we look at God's Word, as we let it renew our minds, as we allow it to transform our thinking and our perspective, as we meditate on Scripture, we begin to see the world through God's eyes and understand His perspective and purposes for our lives. This is what it means here. And so I'm sure if I were to ask everyone across the room, you have your favorite movies, your favorite TV shows. Jules this past week, as she's been getting better, she's been watching a lot of the Disney animated cartoons, you know, the old classics, Fox and the Hound. She had to watch it. She never saw it before. I cried. She didn't. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> watch Fox and the Hound, 101 Dalmatians, Lady and the Tramp. Um, and as she's been watching the, these, she's been talking more and more about wanting to get like a little baby animal for our apartment. And so it's easy. I mean, you think about all these cute little animals. It's like, oh, well, I want one too, you know? And so what we think about shapes our desires. Or similarly, you know, who, does anyone watch The Office? I, I wouldn't recommend The Office. But if you watch The Office, you know, it's, it's funny in ways. Um, I wouldn't say it's totally a sanctified piece of media. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> One thing that's funny about The Office is people don't ask, oh, have you seen The Office? They say, hey, do you watch The Office? As if The Office is something that you just perpetually are always watching and re-watching. Um, but anyway, uh, there's a character in The Office called Dwight Schrute. And so sometimes uh, I have friends and I'll be talking to them and, and we'll be talking and we'll be like, oh, well, that's, you know, we'll hear something that happens in our life. And uh, we'll say, oh, that's kind of like what Dwight said, you know, or that's similar to what Dwight said. We're able to connect our current life with what's happening. We'll let, we're able to say, you know, oh, that's kind of like what Dwight said, or that's kind of like what Jim said. Well, whenever we take out the distractions of the, this world and we start filling our minds, focusing our attention, consuming the Word of God, instead of saying, oh, well, that's kind of like what Dwight said, we say, oh, well, that's kind of like what Paul said. Instead of saying, oh, do you remember that scene whenever Jim and Pam did that crazy thing? We're able to look at a situation and say, thus saith the Lord. That's a powerful witness that we are given. And we're only able to do that if we are renewing our mind in the word of God. And as our minds are being made new, lives are being changed. Meditating on the word allows it to sink into our hearts and our minds. The knowledge of God's will is given so that one can continue to walk well in it. We worship a God's good. And as we see in the final part of our reading today, in the final part of verse 2, by living in this way, the scripture teaches, we are promised to be able to see greater the beauty behind God's perfection in his divine will. And so as we kind of move into a time of response today, I just want to ask you, is your life transformed because of your relationship and your encounter 
with the person of Christ Jesus. Examine your priorities. Ask yourself, am I living for God's purposes or am I living for my own purposes? Look at the kind of fruit in your life. Is it good fruit? Is it bad fruit? Scripture has much to talk about the kind of fruit that you produce. Do you look at the world? Do you look like the world? Do you act like the world? Do you rejoice in the things that the world rejoices in? Are, are you able to relish in sin? Can you love sin? You see, we talk about the transformation of Christ. The transformation is, is, is so incredibly significant in our lives. And so, if I was late today, if I was late today and I, I run up here on stage and everyone's like, well, Parker, come on, you're, you're like three weeks in, dude. You can't be late to a Sunday morning service. And I say, hey, guys, I'm so, so, so sorry. Um, but I, on the way, you know, to work, I was, I was on the road. And uh, as I was on the road, you know, my car broke down on the side, you know. And um, I, I, I looked down, I, I got on the side of the road, and I saw, oh, well, there's, you know, something wrong with my tire and as I'm adjusting it I take one of the lug nuts off to change my tire and the lug nut rolls off into the street and so I go chasing off into the street and I see a big 30 ton logging truck coming straight at me and it, 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 it ran me over and that's why I was late today is because I got ran over by a 30 ton logging truck well, what would you say to that if I showed up and gave you that story? Either I'm a liar or I'm crazy, okay? Because you would say, Parker, Parker. It is absolutely insane. It is absolutely crazy. You cannot have an encounter with something as big and massive and transformative as a logging truck and not be radically, visibly, and permanently transformed. Well, let me ask you, what's bigger, a logging truck or God? You cannot have an encounter with the living God and not be radically, visibly, and permanently changed. And so, we're going to close our service by just taking a moment to meditate and respond in prayer. And so please bow your head for a moment. And just listen to my words, just listen to my voice as we reflect on some of these truths. Reflect today how, how much God has done in your life. Literally count your blessings. Let that drive you to devote your whole self as a living sacrifice before God. To reject the world and embrace what is holy to follow Jesus. Maybe you're a Christian. And this is a reminder today of the call placed on your life to continue pressing into your identity in Christ, putting off the old self, putting on the new. This is a time to renew and reaffirm that commitment. Maybe. Maybe you at one point did make a profession of faith, but never fully surrendered your life over to Christ. You don't know the kind of transformation that Scripture talks about. And you realize, perhaps today, that it's finally time to embrace Jesus with all of you, to receive all of him. Maybe, maybe this is all foreign to you. Maybe you've heard of Jesus but you've never put your faith in him. As you bow your head and reflect on these things, I want you to know regardless of where you're coming from, you've been given a call to give your whole life to Jesus. And if you do, you will have everlasting life with him. If you're willing to do that, just take this time in prayer and surrender everything to him. Say, Jesus, I am yours. I no longer want to live for myself. I want to live totally and completely for you.
You have me completely. Take me and use me, O oh God. Thank you for your sacrifice, for your love, and for your faithfulness to me. Let my life now resonate this truth that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I live, I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen. If you just prayed that, whether it be for the 500th time as a renewal, a reaffirmation of your faith, or maybe for the very first time, where you today surrendered for the first time in your life to King Jesus and received the gift of eternal life, I invite you to stand with me right now. Would you please stand with me if you just prayed that? You know, we've been saved to have union and fellowship with not only Christ, but also with each other. And so look around this room really quick. Look around. If you prayed this, look around at your brothers and sisters in Christ right now. This is the family of God. Amen? Amen? And so now, as a family, as a family, co-heirs with Jesus, we're going to close by singing. We're going to be singing the doxology, praise God from whom all blessings flow. If you have a hymnal in front of you, that's 625. But if you would, I'll just lead us now. Raise your voices, sing a joyous song together as a community, as a fellowship, as a, as a family of God. Raise your voices with me as we sing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. If today you did give over your life to Christ, um, please come talk to me in a moment, right as we close our service. Please come talk to me in a moment because I want to pray for you and I want to join you on this new journey that you are on. And so if you see someone talking to me and you don't want to interrupt, uh, it's okay. Push them out of the way. They'll understand. This is more important. Okay? <laughs> I'm serious. So as you go today, be blessed and bless others. You are sent. Amen.